Going back to the historical thread we were following, um, you spend a lot of time in your book talking about uh, the civil rights movement um, and the demands for self-determination. You know, of course, this is you know, happening a century after the Civil War was ended. Material conditions for African Americans have barely improved in some, in some, in, in many ways. Um, and uh, you know, the government has, has failed African Americans. It's, it's sent out policy that's destructive to African African Americans. There's attacks on black communities. There's the rise of the KKK. Uh, so it's understandable. It's totally understandable and reasonable that African Americans would want more more control, more self determination. But this idea of of black capitalism and black banks was resurrected by none other than Richard Nixon, as you detail in your book, um, and sort of co-opted. Um, talk about the the next compromise that happened um, with uh, under starting with the Nixon administration, but uh, this idea of black capitalism we've seen that's uh, continued to this day. Yeah. So what's happening, you know, within the ghettos is that, you know, in tandem with the civil rights movement. So the civil rights movement, you know, as we remember, is very much about the Birmingham bus boycott and the Selma Bridge, you know, and the Southern sort of, you know, Jim Crow and the uh, Klan and Bull Connor and all this stuff. But really, there's a lot happening across the nation. What's happening up north is even more important, I think, um, than what happens down south, because what happens down south is what we see. What happens up north is what hasn't been covered as much. And what's happening is these people in these communities that are, you know, have suffered from what I call a Jim Crow credit market, who pay more for everything, um, start to get very frustrated. And they understand that these civil rights laws that are passed, I mean, these are monumental reforms, a wonderful sort of advancement, although all they do actually is just give blacks the rights that they were always entitled to, right? The Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. I mean, blacks were always supposed to have the right to vote or since the 15th Amendment. So, so yes, these things are great, but the North essentially saying, hey, let's not celebrate quite yet. For us, it's not about the white water fountains and the black water fountains. We can't even get buses to come into our neighborhoods to take us to work. We pay more for these things um, than everyone else, right? We're stuck in this trap of poverty and um, you know violence and crime and all of those things that come with poverty and so what happens is these protests and riots up in the north and you know Congress starts they call it the urban crisis and it's you know nationwide right days after the civil rights laws are passed Harlem Watts um, and Detroit sort of and Baltimore really kind of just erupt in um, violence and the you know these legislators are like what's going on you know we just passed these civil rights reforms and they come and they meet to talk about it and the thing that they're realizing is that the the rioters the the protesters are targeting these lenders right these aren't just random acts of protest they're actually going for these lenders and they're saying you know burn the books right because these are their oppressors in the north their oppressors are not necessarily the Klan although the Klan does have a presence in the north but it's these lenders it's these exploiters as they call them and so you know Congress meets and they say okay well um, it looks like these are these white establishments so what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw in black businesses into the ghetto because and this comes from you know Richard Nixon Richard Nixon is unwilling to push anything on the civil rights agenda. He is very clear. He says, I have nothing to gain by working with these black leaders. His whole, um, you know, uh, voter, um, his whole uh, sort of platform relies on the Southern strategy, which is that he has to get um, Southern racist sort of white supremacists onto the Republican ticket. And he does this very successfully. And part of what we already talk about is his law and order dog whistling that he does. But the other part that we don't talk about that I try to highlight in the book is this black capitalism. Um, and black capitalism essentially means to Nixon, look, for yes, for centuries, whites have been getting all of these state subsidies. But for blacks, once blacks are saying, hey, we want to cut too, we want the same deal, he says, OK, go to the free markets, best of luck, right? So no programs, no welfare, no um, even poverty reforms. It's all about capitalism. And what he means is you just start your own businesses in the city, right? So even as we have this different credit market, he's saying, okay, well, we'll put black businesses in it. And he doesn't even mean it that much. This is when affirmative action um, comes out. So he says, okay, we'll just throw a few contracts here and there and, you know, give a few loans to black businesses, but it's never robust. He doesn't care about it. Um, and really it's about, you know, his um, commerce department had Maury stands, you know, uh, the, there, there are some people in the administration who think this is a real program and they try to push these reforms and he kind of shoots it down and says, look, 
just come up with some good success stories. That's all people need. It's about hope, you know, um, uh, in business, it's not really actually meant to benefit. Um, and then this whole, the program just sort of morphs out of control after this era is now, you know, uh, encompasses all sorts of, you know, minority programs and female owned businesses. And it started very much as a response to wealth inequality and the discontent that had, you know, segregation had wrought. And now it's very much about, oh, you know, we'll have, you know, black businesses and Native American businesses and women businesses, and this will be, you know, help with us, uh, you know, in diversity and representation. It's no longer about the wealth gap. And you also chart how those, the ideas and policies you talked about under Nixon are continued through today, the Obama administration, the Trump administration even, and a lot of local, and a lot on a local level as well, in, in cities that are controlled by Democrats. Uh, can you talk about that as well? Yeah, so you know, after Nixon, uh, it, it is so this black capitalism idea is so politically successful that you know Ford, Carter, Reagan, Clinton, Obama, Trump all kind of tout these minority businesses. But you know, it changes over time. At first, it's very much about black businesses. It's all the whole program was meant to address segregation, and it was meant as a response to black civil rights protests. And then sort of, you know, Ronald Reagan's kind of waters it down. And so for Ronald Reagan, you know, his whole civil rights agenda, for him, civil rights is about cutting taxes and bolstering the free market, you know? So it's, he, you know, he says, look, I'm fighting for civil rights and what I'm gonna do is lower your taxes. And then Carter, you know, and other, you know, uh, Clinton and others, once the Supreme Court says, look, I mean, this is this, this total, you know, amnesia, the Supreme Court decides in 1978 on the affirmative action program. He said they uphold affirmative action in this case, um, the Bakke case, but they say it's only for diversity, right? So affirmative action is only allowed in education um, if just, just to benefit all students. Essentially what we're saying is, oh, white students would benefit from a sprinkling and smattering of other diverse faces. So that becomes the, the justification for affirmative action. And then in 1989, um, the Richmond case, uh, the Supreme Court says you can't favor any black businesses because that's unfair to white businesses. So the program that Nixon drafts in the first place just falls apart at that era. And then we come up with this sort of colorblind myth, right? So the only sort of sentence of Martin Luther King's entire span of civil rights mobilization is, you know, you shouldn't judge people by the color of their skin, by, by the content of their character, which is this myth of colorblindness. By the way, Martin Luther King n never believed that, right? Martin Luther King was very much about reparations and, you know, bringing people, bringing blacks up to the, the place where whites had, had been um, through active programs. Anyway, so this becomes the, the ideology of affirmative action and so soon this black capitalism programs becomes, you know, community enterprise or minority enterprise and Clinton takes this up big time and this is his agenda for poverty is, you know, microcredit and black banks and these things called CDFIs, community development financial institutions and there's a lot of very good people, um, a lot of, you know, people still today that, that do this work and it's excellent work and I don't think it's anything there's anything wrong with these community organizations. They're way better than the other ones, but it's a very watered down um, response to what, what it started as. And so this is where you get this amnesia, you know, where the court says, look, affirmative action and black capitalism is about diversity. Thurgood Marshall writes this really great dissent in that case saying, you, ha you know, you've forgotten what, you what you're saying is that the government can no longer act to take care of past discrimination. So you were saying, you know, for centuries, blacks have been exempted, like not allowed to, to, to contribute and gain from the economy, right? Blacks through Jim Crow, through segregation and through various means of discrimination, blacks have not been able to enjoy the fruits of capitalism. And they're just, the, the government essentially throws up its hands and says, there's nothing we're gonna do about that. And now it's all about free market and you have to sort of, you know, uh, do it yourself and you can't be benefited by the color of your skin because that's discriminatory toward white. So it really gets convoluted. And to, even to today, um, I mean, Trump uh, last week um, calls, you know, October 24th, whatever last week was, Minority Enterprise Week, you know? And this was the least controversial thing that this very controversial president does. And essentially, you know, what is his, what does he um, promise minority businesses is tax cuts or the the um, 
not even tax, tax cuts for small businesses, but the death tax, which is the estate tax, which applies to people who have a state of more than $5 million on their death. So it's fair to say that this doesn't affect a lot of black um, communities, you know? And so, but this is what we're giving um, to black communities. Even Obama, um, I think this was his whole um, push was black capitalism in what we call in different words now is community enterprise, blah, blah, blah. So we're at this moment now, um, some 150 years later, where we're again having these conversations about white supremacy. We're talking about the Civil War. You know, we're talking about uh, okay. FHA loans that weren't available to uh, African Americans, to the white wealth created for white America that was denied to black America, the poverty and segregation that was, that was inflicted upon black America. So um, in your analysis, where do we go from, from here? You know, I think, so on the one hand, it's really depressing that we, you know, should be having these really high level conversations about how to close the wealth gap. And what we're saying, you know, in 2017 is that, you know, the Klan is not good and Nazis are not good. You know, so, so I think in a way we've moved backwards, but in another way that could be seen as a positive development is that this colorblind sort of post-race post-race myth that Nixon and Reagan and Clinton peddled, that's fallen apart. We are not a colorblind society. We have never been. We are not post-race. Um, we have never been. And so the lie is, I think, coming to the surface now, where you have a president whose agenda is based on white supremacy and his constituents are very vocal about that, you know, and the difference being that now people are talking about it, where before, of course, we were premised on white supremacy. It just we were softer about it and we didn't say, we use different words um, to say the same things. And now we're just calling it what it is. And I think that if we can capitalize on that, if we can you know, say, look, this is white supremacy, then, then maybe we can move forward and say, okay, we all are opposed to this. So the majority of us do not want to um, be part of a system that does this, you know, and that Trump, the whole you know, motivating force of the Republican party essentially started with and continues to be uh, opposed to uh, black uh, rights and opposed to autonomy. And, and part of it is about, you know, this, this lie about capitalism, which I try to get to in the book, is that we, we lie to ourselves that we have this capitalist economy, but we don't. Uh, it's very much, our economy is very much a public-private enterprise. The government has very much subsidized white wealth. They just haven't done it with black wealth. And so, you know, it's a lot of times you see this opposition to any programs that benefit minorities as anti-capitalist, but, but it's a lie. Hey, we want to thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mersha Badaran. Uh, her new book is The Color of Money, and uh, her most other recent book is How the Other Half Banks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this thank you so much extended conversation. Me. And you can watch this full interview at therealnews.com. We're going to break it up into a few parts, and just go to therealnews.com for the full interview. Thank you so much for watching.